Alcoholics Anonymous. I am. Uh, my call sign's right there on the front slide, KC7IIB. It's kind of cutting off down there on the bottom left, so feel free to look me up and send me all kinds of crappy email and things like that. Um, as an amateur radio, there's a lot of information about you that's contained out on the Internet, so that's one thing you just kind of have to open up to and say, well, I'm going to go ahead and expose myself and say I'm an amateur. Things, uh, because it is a federal license that you hold, there is information that has to be accessible outside of your maybe comfort level. Um, but that's just one of the deals that you have to deal with as an amateur. Uh, we're going to go through and talk a little bit about what amateur radio is and how uh, you go about getting licensed and what some of the new cool things are that we're doing as amateurs uh, in the uh, amateur community. So first of all, uh, we're going to talk about what amateur radio is. Uh, then we'll jump into the different types of two-way radios. There's kind of two primary categories that radios fall into, uh, and we'll talk about those. Uh, in that, we'll also talk about a new uh, thing called IRLP, and I'll do a quick little demo on that. Uh, we'll talk about APRS, uh, jump into HSMM, and then I'm going to cover a 25-mile linking project that we did using HSMM and show you the specs and stuff of the equipment that we used and uh, how that all laid out. So I'll uh, definitely try to keep that uh, in the time frame. We've got a lot of information to cover, so I'll try to buzz through a lot of the first stuff because a lot of it's widely available online especially. So what is amateur radio? How many of you are hams in here? All right, cool. So that makes my job a lot easier because you guys already know, especially this stuff. So I'm going to breeze through this. If you have questions, this presentation didn't make it onto the CD, but if you need it, my email address is at the end. You can email me and I'll send it over to you. So, so amateur radio. In 1992, excuse me, 1992, in 1912, uh, the first radio laws were passed by the Federal Communication Commission. In 1914, amateurs started to use radios. So in that started to form the amateur radio service. And it kind of went on from there and it's expanded to what it is today. The FCC originally decided that the amateur radio service was going to be developed and licensable due to a couple of things. One, they wanted hobbyists that were interested in radio and radio technology to be able to kind of innovate that market. Um, also, volunteers for public service. One of the big things amateur radio operators do is they help out with public service. This means working with uh, different uh, volunteer groups, such as like the Red Cross and things like that, going out and doing runs and, and uh, providing communication for runs and bike rides and all that kind of stuff, as well as uh, disaster response. So if there's some type of earthquake or tornado or something like that, going out and helping out with communication assistance on those events. Um, amateur radio was heavily involved, uh, involved very recently when the uh, space shuttle blew up in uh, over South Texas. There was a large amateur population that went down there and helped with the recovery and coordination of the recovery of all the different parts of the space shuttle. So they're definitely involved in a lot of the major disasters. 9-11 was another one. There was tons of amateur involvement over in New York and the surrounding areas due to that event. And uh, all of a sudden, the communication abilities of amateur radio step up, where public service radios tend to uh, fall down and kind of uh, fall on their face. And also, the FCC wanted experts. They wanted experts that were out there that would offer insight into the field and be able to uh, expand on what's already there. One of the big things we've seen in amateur radio lately, and I was just talking to a gentleman before the talk, that there's kind of been a slowdown in technology of amateur radio. Um, there haven't been a lot of new developments. And for the first time, the things that I'm talking about, like uh, HSMM and IRLP, are taking commercial technologies and moving them over to amateur radio. Typically, it's always been the other way around. We as amateurs have developed the technologies and pushed them over to the commercial side. So we've kind of seen a reverse of this, and I'm not sure exactly why that is. A lot of people think amateur radio is strictly a bunch of old guys talking to each other halfway around the world. And if you are an old guy, you can talk to another old guy around the world. That's fine. That's one small portion of amateur radio. There's a lot more you can do. And those of us at this conference that are developers, coders, and things like that can really help out the amateur community by putting some of our skills to the plate and being able to help out in developing some of the new applications. And hopefully these technologies that we've taken from the commercial side, brought over to amateur radio, we can enhance them and send them back over so it makes that side much better. Um, and so that's hopefully what we'll uh, be able to do as amateurs uh, going forward since we've started taking technology from the commercial side instead of giving it back. So how does one go about getting licensed? Well, there's various uh, different license levels. And the licensing has changed fairly recently. Um, it's actually continually changing all the time. Uh, there used to be the big standing thing that you had to have a Morse code test. And the licensors are such now that you do not require a Morse code test unless you want a higher class license. But the basic license is a simple 35 question test. It's called Element 2. And it's basic operation and uh, some engineering stuff. Uh, stuff that a good portion of us should already probably know with just what we do on a daily basis, working on computers and various electronics. So there is no Morse code test if you want to uh, operate from 30 megahertz and above. 
All your public safety and public service stuff that's out there now, your police and fire department, all that's up way higher than 30 megahertz. So you can operate the same kind of radio systems that they do typically on amateur radio with that single license. You now, if you want some other types of abilities and some more long distance type of communication, there's some other tests and some Morse code you have to pass. Now, the fastest Morse code that you have to do if you want to get those licenses is, I believe, five words per minute. Anybody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's five words per minute is the maximum now. So um, I went through that a little while ago when they had the Tech Plus licensing. I went through and got my five words, so I'm done. But I just still hold a, hold a Tech Plus. I haven't got off my butt to upgrade yet, but I think I might do that very soon. So, so what can we do with amateur radio? Well, you can talk to people. So like I said earlier, if you're an old guy, you can talk to another old guy. Even if you're young, you can still talk to an old guy because sometimes you can learn a lot from them. <laughs> so um, you can build trans, uh, transmitters, receivers, and antennas. Now, when I say that, anybody can do it, but amateurs can do it legally. So, and that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole thing here. There's a lot of legal differences in amateur radio in that because anybody can go out and build a receiver or build a transmitter or something like that, but it's not legal. Amateurs can do it legally, so it's always nice to be able to build that kind of stuff, use it on a daily basis or a weekly basis, and actually have made it yourself. Um, I found out that I'm not good at antennas. I'll admit that. I love getting involved in the project, spend all this money to make the stuff, but things never work. So, and I've got a great little story about getting, um, you know, some nice RF energy while trying to adjust a, an antenna. <laughs> so, a couple of my buddies over here helped me out with that by keying the mic for me. So, um, emergency communications. Like I said, you can do a lot of public safety things. There's, if you're involved in it heavily enough, you can get some really cool identification and some really cool access to some really neat places if you get involved in it. Um, a lot of emergency communication centers, EOCs, uh, government facilities, things like that. If you're actually into it, uh, go through their submission process, get your background checks, whatever you need to do. You can actually get some access to some really, really cool places. Uh, TV broadcasting, you have amateur television, which is great. You can actually get, set up your own little TV station and broadcast out and talk to other people and you know, send video uh, back and forth between people. We actually have a, uh, I'm in, from the Dallas area, and we have an uh, ATV uh, repeater there, so people can send uh, images through the repeater and other people can pull them down and stuff. So it's actually pretty cool. Direction finding, we saw the first uh, direction finding contest here at DEF CON. I believe it was the first all-time uh, one, at least the first war driving one, where they sent mobile people out and you had to go find them. That's cool, but that's kind of an amateur radio thing that they've been doing for years in amateur radio. So if you like that and you're kind of into that, you can do direction finding all the time. Somebody will go out and be the fox and everybody else is the hound and they go out in the field and transmit somewhere and everybody else gets in their cars with all their funny looking antennas hanging out the window and the halls down the street trying to find them. So those contests are a lot of fun. A lot of areas actually have regular contests. Like it'll be the third Saturday of every month they'll have a direction finding contest and everybody goes out with all their equipment and uh, some people buy the commercial equipment. I had a Doppler system that I used for a while. It's one of the little four antenna systems that sits on the back of your car, much like the low jack system that police use. So same kind of deal that I have in my car with a little rose compass that gives you the direction of the transmitter so you can pretty much drive right to them. So uh, messed that one up by transmitting into it one day and it doesn't work anymore. So. Now it's just an expensive uh, thing that sits on the car. It looks cool, but it doesn't do me any good, so. Oops, wrong button. Okay, so let's jump into two-way radios. Like I said, there's basically two types of radios. And when a lot of people think amateur radio, they think real big, right? You've probably seen, at least in your neighborhood or somewhere around, the big tower by some dude's house with the big antennas on top. And if you're not into radios and you're not a geek kind of person, you probably look at that and say, what the hell? So, but otherwise, people look at that and think, oh, that's pretty cool looking. I like it. I like those things. I think they look good. So, those are HF communications, or high frequency, basically made for long distance. I'm going all the way around the world. I'm getting out of the local area. Uh, the radio up here on the top is a similar type of radio that you have, and you can see the, uh, the tower here uh, with the nice uh, directional antenna up there on the top of it. So, that's basically communication from state to state or state to countries. It's your moving big time. You're, you're sending your, uh, your transmission long distances. And it typically re involves a quite involved setup, as you can see with the tower. Now, there are some other a a aspects of HF communication that you can do low power and just real small operations and be very portable with it, and that's also fun to play with. But that's typical HF communications. Long distance, I'm communicating long ways away. The other form is VHF and UHF communications. This is the kind that I typically am involved in as a tech plus. This is where I have the majority of my frequency, uh, frequency privileges. You can see here's two examples of a vehicle. These aren't my vehicles. I just pulled these off the internet, so these might be somebody in here. I don't know. Um, but I thought they were kind of cool, especially this bottom one. This looks great. 
So I was mounting some equipment in my car the other day, and I actually had my wife come out and get in the passenger seat and say, do you still have enough room? Because I'm trying to invade over onto her side. And so ever since then, she complains, I don't have enough room with this thing here. And I said, well, I brought you out, and you had your chance to move it somewhere else. But I don't know. It doesn't work. No, no. So I keep wanting to have her just take her own car. You know, So I'll drive in my car. She drives in her car. She doesn't like that idea. So. But VHF UHF communications is basically for local communications, typically. Local cities and counties, kind of uh, communicating back and forth. Just radio to radio, you can communicate several miles depending on how much power you're putting out. We have what are called repeaters, which allow me to transmit to a repeater. The repeater repeats my uh, signal and sends it back out. Then you can get very far communications, especially in these areas uh, over here on the west coast that have mountains. You can put the repeaters up on mountains and you can get all kinds of coverage. So you can get some really neat things. It's very portable, very mobile. The radio that I carry, uh, typically, it, my little handheld radio is here. And I'm going to use this in a demonstration momentarily. So um, it's just nice and small, and uh, I can communicate a lot of places with that. And it's kind of my main form of communication next to the mobile radio that I have up here. Um, all kinds of other good stuff you can do on VHF and UHF. Most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here, in fact, all the stuff that I'm going to talk about, has to do with the technician or, higher, uh, technician or higher class license. So you can do everything with the basic level license that we're talking about. So all the good stuff. And IRLP, this is a new thing. I didn't have it originally in my presentation, but I said, it's so cool, we need to add it in. IRLP is the Internet Radio Linking Project. What happens, what was that? Internet Repeater Linking Project. Thank you. Internet Repeater Linking Project. That's correct. So um, what, what's involved with IRLP is basically you used to have a repeater in an individual area. So you would talk to that repeater and it would repeat your signal out. So some guys then said, hey, what if we link multiple repeaters together? So they did it via a couple different ways. They would do an RF backend and link with uh, like a UHF frequency, a 400 megahertz frequency on a 100 megahertz repeater, and then link multiple repeaters together. They started using data lines, using T1s and things like that to link the repeaters together that way. And then some ingenious people said, hey, wait a second, we've got this big thing called the internet out there. What if we take the data and use voice over uh, the, the, the communication from the repeater, change it over to a data form, use voice over IP, send it over the internet, and connect to another repeater somewhere else? And so what you have now is you have the IRLP, which is a central database, essentially, of all these different repeaters all around the world that you can interconnect to. So from the repeater here in Las Vegas, which I'll show you here in a second, we can talk to people all over the world. So with my little two meter privileges, or 70 centimeter privileges, or my technician license, I can talk to people all over the world. In fact, this morning I was talking to a guy, and I think he was in Poland, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, Holland, Holland. Um, just out here on the balcony, just to verify that my radio was working and everything was all set up. So with that, let me go ahead and get set up here to uh, do a quick little demonstration of IRLP. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the, uh, the, the main Las Vegas node here. It's a 500 watt transmitter, and it's connected to what's called the Western Reflector. The Western Reflector is a central node that multiple nodes can connect into. So it's a many to, uh, one to many kind of relationship, where typically IRLP is a one to one relationship. It's, a, it's one repeater connecting to another one. This is a central node that allows multiple people to connect into it. So let me uh, bring this up here real quick and see if we can uh, make a quick call and see if somebody's on frequency that will come back to us. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> After I'm done with the demo. <laughs> this is KC7IIB Las Vegas doing an IRP demonstration. Is anybody on frequency? KC7IIB. Of course, this is the one thing you're depending on. Uh, the station there that came back, uh, I believe you said you were in New York City. What was the call sign again? This is WB2, Hotel Whiskey Whiskey, New York. Yeah, WB2, HWW. This is Kilo Charlie 7, Indy, India, Bravo, Las Vegas, Nevada, doing a uh, demonstration in a uh, room of probably, what do you think, about 100, 200 people in here maybe? 100 people or so? I'll uh, just do a quick little IRLP demonstration. How do you receive my signal? Yeah, loud and clear. The dropout to radio, my name is Howard. Hotel, I'm Kipsky, Alpha Radio, Denmark. And I'm in Flushing, Queens, 13 miles east of the Manhattan. And I'll say good morning or good afternoon to you guys in Vegas. And I'm on an HT running about two watts. 
WB2HWW, this is Kilo Charlie 7, Indian New Bravo, Las Vegas, Nevada. I appreciate the contact. Is there any other stations on frequency? This is Kilo Charlie 7, India, India Bravo, doing a quick IRLP demonstration from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you, Portland. And I believe that was Portland. Go ahead. Let's try that again. Yankee for whiskey, maybe? This is Kilo Charlie 7, Indian Indian Bravo, Las Vegas, Nevada. Monster in Southeast Alaska. N6CSQ, Barstow, no 3999. It looks like we got a whole bunch of people in there. The station up in Alaska, this is Kilo Charlie 7, Indian Indian Bravo, Las Vegas, Nevada. Go ahead. Maybe. Excellent. I appreciate the contact, Jim. Again, this is Kilo Charlie 7, India, India Bravo. Let's uh, see if we can get one more station in here, and then we'll have to move on with the rest of our demonstration. Again, this is KC7IIB uh, doing a quick IRLP demonstration. Do we have any other stations on frequency? KC7IIB, Las Vegas, Nevada. And John, I just got the last sign, uh, last part of the uh, call sign there, Alpha Alpha Yankee. I appreciate the check in there. So thank you very much. That'll uh, conclude my demonstration, and I appreciate all the stations that were able to come back. This is Kilo Charlie 7, Indy, India Bravo, clear of the Western Reflector, Las Vegas, Nevada. Okay, so um, now that we've finished the demo, the Western Reflector here in Las Vegas is on 447.0. It's uh, run by uh, a gentleman. Uh, W7AOR is his call sign. Um, like I said, that's a uh, central uh, reflector here. So anybody with their, uh, their uh, uh, IRLP abilities, essentially, which is any licensed amateur, can connect up to that repeater and talk to basically anybody around the world. Uh, we weren't able to get anybody out of the country, but you depend on you know, a lot of different factors. Uh, Alaska is pretty close to out of the country. It's a pretty far distant communication there. So it's uh, essentially out of the country, right? Am I offending anybody? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, 447.0. If you go out and do a Google search on IRLP, you can find out all kinds of cool stuff about it. There's a nice central website that'll list all the nodes out, out there and tell you what the status is and where they're connected to. Uh, the Western Reflector is probably one of the biggest ones. The Western Reflector is connected to a reflector up in Alaska. So there's two reflectors actually connected together. So you can get a lot of people. We hear a lot of uh, people from Alaska here. We also hear a lot of people from Las Vegas, obviously, because that's where the node is based. Um, we also have a uh, uh, North Texas reflector. I think it's North, called North Texas reflector. I can't remember. I'm never on that one. Um, but it's kind of cool because you, you can now take this little teeny handheld and I can talk to somebody in Alaska. I don't need that big antenna and all that big fancy stuff. I can do it here. And as you heard a couple of those people were mobile. I've heard people on bicycles. I've heard people just out walking. It's kind of neat. And it's, uh, it's a fun thing to be able to do. And that's using voice over IP. You hear the calls are pretty clear. Every once in a while you'll start to get the typical chop and data kind of uh, mix up that you get from those type of, uh, those type of situations. So that's basically IRLP. So let's move on to APRS. This is another fun thing that I've been playing with lately. Um, automatic position reporting system. This is kind of cool. This is like ultra low jack. Low jack's kind of neat because they turn it on and then somebody has to go out in direction to find the car. This tells me right where I'm at. It gives me the GPS locations. Um, but it's dependent on a lot of other factors. And as you can see with amateur radio, to do that demo, I was dependent on a lot of factors. I was dependent on that I could get to the repeater. I was dependent that that repeater was working. Dependent on whoever's internet connection is being used for that. Dependent on the other guy's internet connection. There was a lot of factors that I'm relying on. APRS is the same way. You're relying on multiple stations for your communication to be able to go through. So it's the automatic position reporting system. It's basically made up of a radio, a GPS, and a TNC. A TNC is a terminal node controller. It's basically like a modem. So what that allows me to do is send digital uh, communications, just like you would over a wire, but over the air. Uh, currently, uh, position is uh, broadcast, uh, or excuse me, current position is broadcast onto the APRS network and received by all the other stations that are out there. So anybody that can hear me then hears that, that position report. 
Um, it uses the AX.25 protocol at 1200 baud when we're running uh, VHF frequencies at uh, 100 megahertz. So you say, wow, that's really slow. But in, in reality, all you're sending is your position, so it's not that big a deal. Now, there is some problems with APRS because of frequency management, things like that. There's a central frequency APRS uses, and um, with all the people jumping on and getting APRS stations up, it's becoming a little bit crowded. So there's some changes that are going to need to have uh, happen to continue using APRS going forward uh, if it keeps growing in popularity. It's great for tracking objects, especially of mobile. This is really used a lot in public service events to track like where ambulances are for races and runs. Um, they can stick a little tracker unit on an ambulance and then follow it anywhere on a map and know exactly where that station is. Also, if you wanted to track your buddy, theoretically, you could throw one of these little units in the back of the car and then track wherever they're at, same kind of thing. So, um, it also allows for text messaging. Now, that's no big deal anymore since we all have that pretty much on our cell phones, um, but you can send messages back and forth from station to station, uh, sending simple text messages back and forth. So it's kind of neat to be able to do that as well. The main thing is the position reporting, though. Um, an APR station broadcasts a beacons, um, which is basically a single packet that goes out of the, the station and is received by any stations that are within range of that other station. So if I transmit a beacon here, anybody around this building, around this area is going to hear that and be able to log that into their map. Uh, the packet may be received and decoded by anybody who hears it. So that means you can't really think, okay, I'm only going to send this to a specific person or a specific place. It's anybody that can hear that is going to be able to understand the communication. Digipeter stations uh, hear that packet and basically will repeat it for me. So they'll send it on. So right now, I'm just up here and just a little person up on the, uh, the table here. I send off a beacon packet. That will then be relayed by other stations. So then that will be relayed over and over and over through uh, various Digipeters to get to wherever I'm trying to uh, get the packet to ultimately. Um, and then eventually, if I need to go real long distance, it should drop off to an iGate station, which takes that data, routes it up over the internet to another iGate station, and sucks it down on the other side, and sends it out. So that allows you to be able to talk back and forth long distance uh, over the internet using this digital uh, communication to be able to send position reports back and forth over the internet. So this is a quick map of the uh, United States with all the different stations reporting in. Can't really tell much from this. It's pretty, uh, pretty convoluted. There's a lot of stations out there doing APRS, and like I said, it is getting a little bit busy. So, uh, but you can see all the little icons represented with their co respective call signs on there, uh, all kind of piled up on top of each other. And see, my station's right, right there. So, um, <laughs> yeah, right. So, but uh, if you zoom down on the map like this into a little bit more detailed form, you can see the actual street level and then the icon with the call sign. That's my call, KC7IB, and then that's uh, uh, one of the locations in Dallas where I was at. Uh, Actually, close to my house now that I look at it. So, uh, but that can actually zoom down to that kind of level so you can get that kind of detail. You can use different mapping programs, and I'll show you one example of a real, real basic software. You can use real advanced mapping stuff like, uh, um, you know, the Microsoft mapping program, MapPoint, and, uh, you know, some other things like that that they build into APRS. So you can get some really good maps in there. You can build your own maps and, and do position reporting on all the different stations. With those iGate stations, they poured all the information up to the internet. And there are websites out there that you can actually go to and type in the call sign and pull up the location of these different, uh, these different stations. So you can actually pull them up at any time and see the location of where these are at. So types of API, uh, API stations, we have digipeters, which are basically like repeaters, internet gateways, fixed stations, trackers, mobile stations, and passive stations. Passive stations is more like what we're going to do today. We're just going to kind of listen to what's, what's going on out there. Mobile stations can be things in your car. Trackers, it's basically a device that's going to be stuck in something, like in a, uh, in a vehicle or something like that. It's not going to have two-way communication. It's just going to be sending out its position that everybody else will be able to look at it. Fixed stations is going to be something like in the house with maybe a weather station attached to it, sending off weather data as well. So here's basically like a low-cost tracker station. Uh, you've got basically four main components, the radio, the TNC, uh, which you can use like a uh, TNC, the, uh, the uh, pick encoder, or the uh, Tiny Track 3, which is like this little blue box down here, uh, which are about a, I think, 70 bucks or so if you buy it assembled, 40 bucks if you put it together yourself, a battery and a GPS. You can get yourself a little Pelican case like this, throw them all in there, and you're good to go. So, oh, and you need an antenna. I forgot to put that on there. So, um, But then you've got all that stuff in that little case. You can throw that in the back of a vehicle, and it's, it's all good and, and tracking it uh, and doing whatever you need to do. So kind of a little portable APRS station there. And you can see it's just a little handheld radio like the one I've got up here. So the interconnect is basically your GPS connects to the TNC, which connects to the radio. So it's pretty straightforward connection. It's nothing majorly complex in the interconnect. Mobile stations. Um, basically, mobile stations is the same as like a tracker station, except you have some additional abilities. You typically would have some type of uh, computer with it, 
uh, maybe some additional display or some additional uh, information coming out like that. So it's uh, basically the same except you add on a PC. Here's one of the pieces of software you can use. This is called uh, APRS Street Atlas or APRS Plus. Uh, it uses the Street Atlas program. You've got a display here of all the different stations it's heard, and then that will correspond to maps. And you can pull out the mapping data of where those stations are at, pull up maps, and do tracking. Uh, if we can hold questions at the end, just so I can get through everything. So. And here's a typical mobile interconnect. You've got your computer here with a GPS fed into your computer, which also means you can track your location so you can do all the fancy little street mapping thing that Lake Street Atlas and all the other ones allow you to do. That interconnects to your TNC. That connects to your radio. So again, pretty straightforward interconnect there. You also have a purpose-built radio, which is what I've got up here. Uh, it's a Kenwood D700, which basically acts as the computer for me. So what it allows me to do is I can connect a computer to it like I have today so we can actually get a full map display and things like that. But it's got a display on it that I can get full readouts of what's going on. And I've got a screenshot of one of the readouts that we can see here. So the GPS and the radio is really all I need. And then I've got an optional computer that I can connect to it. Um, and then that uh, sends all the data out there. So uh, that's a great little radio as well. So when we look at the quick little APRS demo here, this is a uh, screenshot of uh, one of the stations that I talked to. This is one of my buddies, Mike, uh, KC7IID. This is his station. We were sending messages back and forth. I was in Dallas. He was in Salt Lake City. And we were messaging back and forth. And you can see right here, it gives his, uh, his position and says he's 100, uh, excuse me, 1,016 miles away from me, uh, kind of in the north, uh, northwest there. So, uh, which is accurate if I was in Dallas and he was Salt Lake. Um, and then it gives a couple little comments here. It gives his call sign up here at the top. You've got, uh, you can see the type of radio he's using. The, the uh, speed of the communication is 1,200 baud. Uh, his status is in service. And then right here is his icon. Uh, so which the icon you can change. And this is also the grid square locator here. It gives me a little bit better idea of where he's at uh, uh, locally or uh, nationally there. So let me pull up a little map here real quick. I've just had this APRS station running. And we're not seeing too many stations on this. Uh, but you can see we've got actually three stations there. Uh, we've got KC7IID-2, uh, uh, which is Mike. He's actually out in the parking lot. Uh, KC7IID, my station is the little house right here. And then there's another car up here, which is uh, KG6MUN-3. So let me back this out a little bit here. And it looks like that's all we've actually received at this point. It could be that the reception is a little bit poor in here. But there's a lot of different APR stations out there um, that would be reporting in. I seem to have been getting bad reception here on the APRS network uh, through the uh, last little bit. So um, definitely not a, uh, n not a well, uh, very large reception around the area. So, uh, But there's definitely a lot of stations involved in that. So you can see with a simple map like this, it doesn't give you a lot of detail where everything's at, but you can get a pretty good idea of where the stations are located and uh, the, uh, the fact that they're tracking. Uh, typically, if they're, they're mobile, I mean, you can imagine that this guy's probably mobile. He's here on, a, on some sort of major road. I'm not sure what road there is. I'm not familiar with the roads here. Uh, but on some of the software, it'll actually, you'll be able to click on the stations, and it will give you various information on them. So let's uh, actually pull this up here. We'll pull up Mike's station. Oops. There we go. So we can see here, um, here's Mike, KC7IID. Uh, we can see he's actually giving a status of a route to DEF CON. Actually, I think he's already here because he's right over there. So, uh, and then this gives it the actual packets that we've received and the path of the packets some various information there. So uh, you can pull, up, pull that up. With different software, you can do all kinds of different things. You can track stations long term. You can pull up, pull up dedicated maps and only track certain stations. You can do all kinds of fun stuff with it. So uh, this program right here is called WinAPRS. It's a free download. Uh, but it's uh, they want like to register it. You have to pay some money. I haven't registered mine because I typically don't use this one. So. But then this is back on the D700. This is what it would look like. This is the actual D700 here. And then this is what the display looks like close up so you can actually see it. So you can get the information on the actual GPS coordinates of that station. So HSMM, let's talk about that because that's kind of some fun stuff. HSMM is high speed multimedia. It's kind of a cool little deal. Um, it's uh, high speed multimedia. is basically 802.11 A, B, and G for hams. So we can't have DEF CON without talking about 802.11, right? But I promise I won't talk about any of the vulnerabilities or any of that kind of stuff because we already know about those things. So different laws apply to hams, uh, especially in regards to 802.11 stuff. Uh, you've got part 15 versus part 97. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between those. And there's been a recent law that's changed uh, just in the last couple of uh, days that uh, has affected those. So we'll talk about that as well. 
So part 15 versus part 97. Part 15, that's all you common folk that don't have licenses. Part 97, that's the licensed folk, like me and the other people in here that have licenses. So, uh, and you don't always have to operate. If I'm licensed, it doesn't necessarily mean I have to operate under part 97. It means I have the ability to. Um, if I choose to, then I have to follow certain rules. Just like if you operate under part 15, you're supposed to follow certain rules. You don't have to, but it is federally recommended. So off-the-shelf equipment, so you go to your local Best Buy, CompUSA, or, you know, God forbid you go to Fry's for some reason. Uh, you can buy, uh, you buy equipment, your little Linksys or your Cisco or whatever. It's intended for Part 15 operation. They're not expecting you to use that for amateur radio, although you can do it. So it's expected for Part 15. If you're licensed, you can actually operate it under Part 97, which gives you some unique advantages. So your basic advantages you get, in a nutshell, are more power and the ability to use any antenna you want. And more power is always a good thing, right? Especially when you're doing a little Wi-Fi shootout contest and stuff. So uh, a lot of that stuff's a lot more legal if you have a ham license. So, um, But sh like I said, sure, you can do this. You can do anything you want. You can go buy this Nexus thing. You can hook it up to whatever kind of generator you want and crank out all kinds of uh, wattage out of a thing, but it's not legal. And so if you have a license, you can actually do it legally. So there's uh, some, just some rules that we need to kind of follow here. So. Um, but with a license, you're basically free and clear and you're not breaking any federal laws. So chances of you getting caught doing anything are probably pretty rare as it is. But if you do, they're going to nail you pretty hard because it is, uh, it is a federal offense. So this is the rule that was just passed fairly recently. Uh, it was passed on the 12th. Uh, it's FCC Rule 04165. And it changed the way antennas specifically are specced out for uh, 802.11 and various uh, wireless devices. Uh, it basically impacts part 2 and part 15 of the operation and mainly section 2.18 is where we're mainly interested. And it basically talks about replacement antennas for unlicensed devices. Unlicensed devices are things like Linksys access points, Cisco access points, all that kind of stuff. Because you yourself don't have to have a license to use that. You can just go buy it and it's wireless and you use it. So it specifically talks about the replacement antennas for those devices. Basically says uh, companies, oh, what, what I'm saying here is... Uh, the, it allows you to uh, change out those antennas based on manufacturer's recommendations. And I know what you're saying is, wait a second, there's companies out there like Fabcorp and all the other ones that sell antennas, right? Well, it's legal to sell them, it's just not legal to use them. So that's a little loophole that Fabcorp doesn't necessarily tell you about until now. Now the laws have actually changed. So you could always go to Fabcorp and buy these big antennas, these high gain things, and plug them into a little Linksys access point or whatever you're using, but that's actually illegal. Now, why? That's the law. That's what it said. Can you do it? Sure you can do it. If you're running under Part 97, it's legal. You can actually do it and you have no problem. So, uh, legal to sell, illegal to use unless you're licensed. Basically what it changed this net to now is manufacturers can le uh, list out the specifications of an antenna. So it used to be that they had to specifically say this antenna was tested and meets within our criteria. Now they can say we tested a 14 dB Yagi with this and it was within spec. So now you can go get any 14 dB Yagi or lower and use it. So it actually changed it in the benefit of unlicensed people, which actually makes it kind of nice for places like Fabcorp because now they're selling stuff and it can actually be legally used on any kind of equipment without a problem. So that's basically what changed this. So it kind of took away from the Part 97 operation a little bit because before in Part 97 we could use any antenna we wanted to, but now pretty much anybody can as long as it meets within the manufacturer's specifications that they'll put out with the equipment. So Part 97 pros and cons. Part 97 uh, pros. Many antenna choices. I can use any antenna I want on my radio. I can use anything I want. I can use it on an access point. I can do whatever I want as far as the antenna goes. I can make it. I can buy it. I can do whatever I want that way. Um, and I uh, you know, have a lot of uh, opportunities to use uh, different types of antennas and uh, different types of setups. So that's uh, actually a very nice thing. Power amplifiers. I get up to 100 watts of power out of my access point. So the little ones off the, off the shelf are considerably less than that. And I think... Uh, I, I think the limit is uh, like one watt or two watts maximum, so I think I've got that in the next slide. And I can, what is that? I think it's 100 mils. 100 mils? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very, very little. So 100 watts of power, I've got a lot of power that can come out of my access point without a problem at all and fully within the law. So, um, and I can legally modify equipment. So if I take it and modify it, I can actually put it back onto the air without a problem. So that's no problem. I can take this little handheld radio here, modify it all up the, to make it do whatever I want it to do, and put it back on the air without a problem. 
you go take a Motorola radio and try to do it on a police frequency, that's illegal. That's, uh, you violate the tactic seconds of the radio. So it allows me to be able to uh, modify equipment and be able to put it back on the air. The cons of running under Part 97, encryption. This is a big debate right now because um, in amateur radio, it's designed as everything to be open. Open and allow anybody to interconnect and allow anybody to do anything as long as they're licensed. So the debate about encryption is you can't use encryption on typical radio systems because you're trying to obscure the message, and that's kind of the thing. If you're trying to obscure the message, you can't use encryption. But here, if I take the stance of I'm running a Part 97 HSMM station, and I don't want unlicensed people to connect to it, so I'm going to encrypt my data with a web key to prevent other people from connecting to it. Now I'm doing that to protect the integrity of my station, and that is legal. But if I'm trying to encrypt to obscure the data, that is illegal. So there's a big debate on what side encryption falls on. So right now, kind of the standing rule is you can encrypt it, but you have to publicly post your rep key, which is, which is fine, because if you think about it, the average person isn't going to know to go to the ham radio website of your club, dig down to some stupid link down there, and see the actual rep key. Nor are they going to go to the trouble for your stupid station at your house, right? They're going to go down to a neighbor that doesn't have rep to get on the internet or do whatever they're doing. Um, Easy, to, uh, easy for content to violate FCC rules with amateur radio. There are specific rules about what you can and can't do, as many of you are aware. You can't get on and use kind of foul language. You can't go surf porn sites. You can't do that kind of stuff because that's not part of amateur radio. Sure, you can do it, but you're violating the law. And the other hands out there that do direction funding will come find you and they will report you to the FCC. Um, so you can uh, easily violate content rules. Automatic power tr controls are required for different types of stations. Third-party traffic is an issue. That's what I was talking about. If I ha set up a station, what happens if somebody else connects to it and starts sending data through me? I'm actually responsible for that connection. So I have to do my best to keep that uh, signal or that station in, uh, uh, intact where nobody else can connect to it. And then identification. I have to send out my call sign at a regular interval and identify my station. So those are some of the negatives with Part 97. What was that, I'm sorry? How do you, uh, the question was, how do you do that with Radio Heaven? One, you can do it with the SSID, because the SSID is regularly broadcast, so you can put the call sign as your SSID. That's kind of the unwritten standard. Um, the other way you could do it is um, by, uh, th there's some applications out there that embed it within a ping packet. So instead of the ping packet being 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, you know, that kind of thing, it actually puts your call sign in the body of the ping packet. And then you have to ping a station on the network and it sends it out. So as long as the call sign goes out over the wire, you're fine. Um, then uh, basic part 15 operation pros and cons. There's no content, uh, uh, no content restrictions. If I set up an access point under part 15, I can do whatever I want, right? I can download porn all day long on the wireless access point. I can do whatever I want. It makes no difference whatsoever. No third party issues. Welcome aboard, boys. Come on. Anybody can come on unless my ISP doesn't like it, right? They're the only ones that are going to complain about it. Um, strong encryption available. I can do whatever I want, right? I can encrypt it. I can VPN it. I can do whatever I want. Um, more frequencies uh, available. Um, because within the Part 97 operation, specifically with HSMM and 802.11b, you have a limited frequency range. It's only uh, channels 1 through 6, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that, that you can operate in. So you don't have the higher uh, frequencies or the higher channels uh, available to you. So you actually get more frequencies if you use Part 15. And you don't need to identify. I can put the thing up, plug it in, turn it on, and never use it, and it doesn't make a difference. It can just sit there and, and, uh, and, uh, and operate. Very limited hardware operations. That's definitely a con. It's kind of what you see is what you get. You buy it, and that's pretty much it. With the exception of some Linksys access points that we recently found, you can load Linux and things like that on. So uh, some, some little changes. Low power, uh, low transmit power, one watt. Uh, I still think one watt is the maximum if you have a fixed station and you have to meet a specific requirement for a fixed station, having antennas literally mounted to the wall. They can't be like removable, and the station has to be bolted down and all that kind of stuff. But again, on the amateur side, you get like 500 watts, or 100 watts. Um, yeah, 500, great, right? Get yourself in trouble, even with a license. Um, and then you share it with uh, many other unlicensed users. So that's uh, kind of a negative in any situation that you have uh, a bunch of unlicensed people on there because uh, you never know what they're going to do and what they're going to come up with. So what can Part 97 do? High power, 100 watts, right? That's pretty cool. You can do a lot of fun stuff. You can make your access point go really, really far with 100 watts. Uh, different antennas, aftermarket, homebrew. You can pretty much do whatever kind of antenna you want and set it up, make it. Uh, build it, test it, whatever you want, and then modify build transceivers uh, and uh, antennas and all that kind of fun stuff. So there's a lot of different advantages uh, with Part 97 that you can do with HSMM versus uh, regular Part 15 operation. So let's talk about the 25-mile linking project here. Uh, I've got about 10 minutes left, so I'll try to get through these here as fast as we can. Oops. 
Okay, so the 25 mile weekend project was for a uh, bike ride uh, that we did in, uh, in the Dallas area. And what it basically was is uh, the stations, or the stations, the uh, cyclists were going to be biking over a 25 mile course, um, starting down here in the, on the left side, this is the start and stop, and then they're coming all the way up around this loop and then back down. You can see the mile markers here in the middle. Um, and so we had a couple of uh, key stations here. This is our first station right over here at start and stop. We have the Army uh, COE Tower in the middle, and then rest stop three is our farthest point out. Um, and so we had a total of uh, 20 miles to go out uh, through, the, through the course there, 20.93, 25 if you count out to the end here. So the home base was our N25 N2 station, uh, conveniently located on the top of one of the military buildings there in uh, Richardson, Texas, just outside of Dallas. Uh, you can see, as seen from the, the start stop, this is the top of the military building. Right there on the corner is where we had our access point and our, uh, our main connection. Here's another view of it up here on the 16th floor. We were right here on the corner. Uh, this is kind of a satellite view of the setup that we had. Start stop over here, N25 N2, and then we actually had our internet feed coming from one of the other military buildings. So it was piping over a connection to the uh, main NT5 NT station. And this is typically what we had for our equipment. We had a WAP 11 repackaged in a sprinkler, uh, sprinkler box, one of the outdoor boxes. They actually work really good. They're nice and uh, fairly watertight, uh, pretty easy to uh, mount the equipment in. So we basically took WAP 11s and put them in little sprinkler boxes like that. So here's the overall network design. We had our main internet feed from the, uh, the Eisen Center, and it was going to the Nortel Tower. Um, that was our, kind of our main internet uplink. And then from there, from the uh, Nortel Tower, we were going out to the Army COE Tower that we had access to. And then we had these two remote uh, rest stops. And then we also had the, uh, the start-stop here that was connecting back. And then we had two uh, different mobile stations that were out there that were kind of independent of the network, but were sending data back on the internet. Uh, we had uh, webcams included in some of these locations, as you can see, that the goal was to be able to get live video feeds back from those over the uh, HSMM network back to the main, uh, the main start stop station, as well as uploading the images to the internet. Um, this is a program that we used uh, to do all the RF planning for it. If you haven't used it, check it out. It's called Radio Mobile. You basically put in your uh, coordinates of where you want your first station to be and where you want your second station to be. You put in your elevations, and it will kind of uh, graph it out and tell you if you're going to be able to make the connection. Uh, it uses uh, topography maps and be able to tell you if you need the station higher or lower. Say I've got a 300-foot station over here and a 200-foot station over here, and they're 50 miles apart. You put in the GPS coordinates, and it will tell you if you're going to be able to make that based on the curvature of the Earth and all the other factors that uh, play into that. So you can see here, here's our, all of our plans here to be able to see the NT5 NT tower all the way down to the COE tower, and we're able to make that connection. So here's our LOS verification or line of sight verification. Uh, this one's from the COE tower. You can see this is the Nortel building here in the distance, and this is from rest stop three. So we do have line of sight the entire way, which was very convenient for this. It made it uh, a lot easier for us to deal with. We're setting up a uh, uh, network right now for uh, our annual balloon fest that we do in Plano, uh, Plano, Texas, that uh, is a little bit more complex than this because we've got uh, hundreds of balloons that, hot air balloons that take off, and we've got to track them all over, and we've got different requirements this year that we've got sites all around the city that we've got to uh, get connection to and stuff. So it's a little bit different deal this time than uh, the connection. Something a little bit different this way. We don't necessarily have line of sight the entire way. So, but these are the shots here to verify that we have line of sight back and forth. This one's uh, 20.93 uh, 20 miles back to the, uh, the Nortel building there. This is the uh, setup on the CO, uh, Army COE tower. Uh, this uh, side right here is the link uh, station over to the rest stops. This side over here is linking to back to NT5 NT. Here's one of our webcams, and here's one of our guys up there, KD5 and ML, uh, up, uh, up on the tower uh, doing some work. Again, this is one of our uh, WAP 11 bridge radios that we've got set up here, and you can see these poles that we uh, hooked it up to. So we basically got a whole unit with the antennas and everything that we then take up to the tower and mount onto the tower, so we don't have to deal with the actual tower itself. We can get all the spacing and stuff right on the ground first. And then this is the webcam that we had uh, up there in a nice, uh, nice controllable box where we could control the scan and uh, pan and tilt of the, uh, of the, uh, the webcam. So this is our station out here at, uh, at uh, rest stop three. Um, no line of sight from the rest stop. We set up the, uh, the little mobile towers there, and we had no line of sight from that actual spot. So somebody happened to notice we did have it over here at this playground equipment in the far distance. So we went over to the playground equipment, uh, put up the uh, antenna on that, and we were able to make a connection here, uh, putting the uh, antenna up there. And then we ran a Cat 5 cable all the way back over to where the rest stop was. So yeah, about, about 500 feet of uh, Cat 5 there. So it ended up working out just fine for us, and we were able to make that connection. 
So the results of all this, uh, the Internet Gateway to NT5 NT uh, worked. It was all part 15 and it actually worked. So that was, that was a big success. We were able to get the Internet connection and be able to get that all out. NT5 NT was a great location. It was high enough. It was centrally located. We had line of sight all the way around from all of our stations. We were able to do that uh, very easily. Rest stops were able to connect to NT5 NT using part 97. So we were able to connect up through all the rest stops in. Uh, we did run into some routing issues, uh, and I wasn't actually out on the field for a good portion of that, and some of those guys are radio guys, they're not computer guys, and so that's where we need this kind of group that knows the computer side to get into the radio side more and help these guys out, because when it comes to routing issues, they have no clue. Um, <laughs> Um, and so we ran into some various routing issues. I suspect it was some translations with mats and things like that that they were, uh, they were doing. But overall, it was a success. Next year when we do this, we'll be able to do it even better, a little bit more efficient, be able to put a little bit less time into it. Just like our balloon festival, we did it last year. Eh, it was okay. It sort of worked this year. It's going to be much better, and we've got a lot bigger plans for it because we can improve on it each year. The whole goal of doing these type of things is to prepare ourselves for emergency related events. So when we do get called upon by uh, government agencies and things like that to assist them, we can go out and we have the skills and the abilities to be able to go out and do these kind of things. But we need the developers like in this room to be able to develop software like Radio Mobile to be able to do that kind of fun stuff. The few people that are out there that know how to do this, they do it. And some of them actually sell their software and make money on it. So theoretically, you could make money doing that. Um, although amateur radio is more kind of on the open source type deal where everything's free and open. But you could do that and develop software and do fun things. I have a radio control program for this uh, D700, and I'm not sure if the guys here that wrote it or not, it's, it's working okay. It's, it's all right. It could be a little bit better. Um, I, I suspect it's more of a time thing. Somebody's just got to put the time down to actually remotely control the program. Um, but somebody with the right skills could really do that and make that thing scream and be able to do it right from the computer and control it and do all that kind of fun stuff. So I'll put the call out to the developers here and say, jump in the amateur radio and help us out. We need the help. So in conclusion, ham radio is more than just talking to some old guy halfway around the world, although you can do that. As we saw, you can talk to people all over the place, Alaska uh, and some of the other places that we talked to there in, in New York and whatnot. Uh, so you can carry on conversations with people all over everywhere. Uh, it's a great hobby to be able to do that. Uh, being in town has its advantages. You pick up the advantages of Part 97 as well as some other things. Some states restrict the ability to have like things like radar detectors in your car and uh, police scanners and stuff like that. If you have a ham license, guess what? You can have all that fun stuff because it's a radio receiver, right? Right? It's receiving that radio transmission. I'm not, it's on a hobbyist. That's all it's for, I promise. So <laughs> things, things like the radar detector and the scanner, you can actually have those. Of course, local laws, you need to check those uh, and verify that it's okay to have those kind of things in those areas. Um, IRLP, APRS, HSMM, they're a lot of fun. It's really easy to talk to people, really easy to find stuff out. There's a lot of really knowledgeable people out there uh, that can help, help, uh, help you out in lots of different situations. And getting licenses isn't that hard. You might actually learn something. If you're not familiar with all the content and the licensing uh, regiment, you can actually go through and actually probably pick up some, some good information. If not, um, I frequently get on the radio. If I'm trying to research something, I'll get on and start talking to people. And there's people out there that do just about everything. You run into everybody from nuclear engineers to guys that uh, clean toilets for a living. So, I mean, you run into everything. And you can talk to them about different types of uh, environments and different configurations. There's lots of computer guys out there that are doing things uh, on their networks, interfacing the radio stuff with everything else, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So I encourage everybody to get involved as much as they can. So with that, that concludes my presentation. This is my email address. If you need a copy of the presentation, feel free to email me, dc12 at brettnilson.com, um, or you could also put dc12 at kc7iib.com. That'll also work. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and uh, open it up for any questions. Yeah. Sure. The question was the safety ramifications in regards to, uh, to power and, and especially higher power in the antennas. There's a lot of issues with that. I was an RF field technician for a while uh, working on very high power transmitters and I was required to wear uh, a little RF device that would uh, track my exposure for the day and it was reset. It would reset it each day. Um, and when that alarm went off, that meant I hit my half, half level of that. And so basically I had half as much time left or wait for the second alarm. Um, kind of a funny story, I was working out on a, uh, installing a site out on a radar installation and they did a test fire on one of the radars, it was a military base, they test fired one of the radars and I'd been there five minutes and my alarm instantaneously went off. So one, one little quick test fire and it was already half. That is a major issue. There's a lot of problems with that. You can have a lot of issues. I don't know about all the specifics, but be very careful and make sure you read about what you do. I had an incident with setting up a little directional antenna and was holding on to some things I shouldn't have been holding on to and uh, we transmitted and it was only 50 watts and it, it 
it moved me pretty good. So, um, <laughs> yeah, um, there's some stories with, uh, you know, all kinds of stories out there about people getting burns and, and all kinds of things. So RF is very, very dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, be very, very careful. So definitely be careful with high power stuff and, and, and do your research before you start plugging things in and, and, and or getting close to it because it can have some definite long-term effects. So. Yeah, and I heard that, and I, I, I heard that for the first time at the conference. I didn't realize that 2.4 gig was the resonant frequency. So, um, apparently, okay, 2.54. So, so apparently that uh, can cause a lot of problems, uh, especially with 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 uh, 802.11 networks. So, uh, definitely be careful with uh, with high power stuff. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of milliwatts will, will do it. I had a buddy that was uh, using just a regular access point, and for whatever reason, he was outside his house hooking up an antenna under one of the eaves of the house in the rain. I don't know why he was doing this. And he had it all plugged in, and he was out there standing in the rain barefoot, and he's hooking it to the metal eaves under the house. And he just got a, he just got a little shock. And I mean, it was just enough to give him a jolt, but he came to work the next day. He says, what the hell happened? He says, I got this little thing. I was like, that was the RF energy from the access point, and you were conducting right there in the puddle of water you're standing in, you nitwit. So that's that's the problem with the Part 15 operations is anybody can buy an access point and go out there and shock themselves. So, any other questions? Sure. The, the, the question there was basically setting up a, a, a mesh type network, where, a typical type network where you've got multiple nodes connecting in. Everything in HSMM right now is pretty much links, linking point to point kind of stuff back and forth. So the question here is, what do we do to connect multiple people in and kind of interconnect? Well, there's some software out there on the commercial side that we have now, um, like Mesh AP and things like that, that people can load up and create these mesh networks. We need somebody to port that kind of stuff over to amateur radio and start using it there. HSMM is brand new. 802.11 is fairly new. And amateur radio just said, hey, wait a second, that's on our frequencies. We can start using this. And they started moving some of that stuff over. That's pulling from the commercial side. So um, basically, we need to take that information over there, the commercial tools, and bring them back over to the side. So I'm being this, giving the signal that that's my time. So if you have any other questions, feel free to email me or catch me in the halls afterwards. Thanks for uh, coming to the talk.